Hello and welcome. This is L.A. Rathbone. This is a new series on Slackware 14.2. This component will cover the installation of Slackware 14.2. Um, this is an update from my previous uh, series which covered Slackware 14.0. I'm going to leave those up for now um, until I decide what to do with them since they may assist for uh, older machines and older versions of Slackware. But you see the thing is there's been a number of new technologies that have become mainstream in the past in the past few years that makes the old series somewhat outdated now. So I thought I would do an updated series. Now I'm doing this in VirtualBox uh, for the purpose of this demonstration. So I'm going to set up a new virtual machine. Um, I'm going to call it Slackware-YouTube. Type Linux. That's correct. But I'm going to change it to other Linux. I'm not sure if it would make a difference really, but I'm going to do that. They're saying the recommended amount of memory is 512 megs. I think that that's not adequate. I'm going to bump it up to 1024, which is about a gigabyte. Well, it is a gigabyte. So I'm going to click uh, Next. I am going to create a virtual disk now. That's fine. That's fine. I'm going to make it uh, 50 gigabytes, though, not 8. That's not going to be enough for anybody. Even 50 is not going to be uh, particularly large. But again, uh, for the purpose of this demonstration, it should be perfectly adequate. Now that we've created it, we still want to change some settings. So I'm going to go down to System. I'm going to um, enable EFI because uh, this demonstration is going to show how to install Slackware on an EFI or UEFI system, um, which a lot of motherboards now that are coming out only support that and then they don't support uh, legacy BIOS mode so that's one of the main reasons why I decided to do an up updated series plus uh, we can go through some other things as well as we go so let's bump the processors up to two this is not really necessary but I've got eight CPUs on this thing so I might as well make use of uh, two for the virtual machine um, PAE emulation should be enabled I'm not sure if they'll even let you disable it um, they shouldn't really let you disable it to be honest but let's keep it enabled um, that's fine that's fine oh except for we need to make sure that we put our DVD in there I'm using the slack or the 64-bit 14.2 install DVD and I highly recommend that you just install the DVD as opposed to uh, the CD-ROMs since it has everything all in one place um, all you have to do is download the ISO and you can uh, select that from there. Again, that's another update from last time. 64-bit um, is completely, almost completely overtaken 32-bit in terms of uh, software. So um, the this series is going to cover 64-bit Slackware. So let's select that one. Audio, I can, I know we can leave that alone. Network, I know we can leave that alone. And I think that we are otherwise good. So I'm going to click OK. Um, what I'm going to go ahead and do next is verify that everything's correct. Two processors, a gig of RAM, um, Slackware 64-bit. Looks good to me. Um, what I'm going to do is go ahead and start this virtual machine, and I will meet you back here. All right, we're back. When you start uh, Slackware 14.2 um, in EFI mode, on, on an EFI motherboard, it will start up GNU Grub version 2.0 rather than the old school syslinux which is fine all we have to do is press enter on the default option um, there's no more huge smp.s there's only huge.s that's because on slackware 64-bit uh, smp is not uh, it's a given there's no need to have two separate ones on 64-bit so i'm going to start that up now you see the two penguins present that's because we have two cpus running um, we just want to choose a, a US keyboard, so we're going to press enter. If you require a different type, press 1 and then press enter, and then it'll uh, give you some other options. Okay, now we're ready to get started. So we're going to log in as root. There's no password required uh, for the purpose of uh, this live DVD installer. We'll change that later on, don't worry. First things first, we need to partition our hard drive. I'm going to use FDisk um, since um, 
it would be a little too easy to use CF disk. Uh, we want to have a bit of an educational exercise here. So we're going to start uh, F disk on dev SDA. And you'll note that it says it's, uh, the device did not have a rec recognized partition table, so they created a new DOS disk label, but that's not correct. So we want to go ahead and change that. Press M to see the list of options, uh, commands rather, and uh, we want to create a new GPT partition label because the GPT is what is the type of partitioning that we need to do with EFI. So hit G and press enter, and now when we do P, it shows uh, the disk label, disk label type as GPT. Now we want to go ahead and start making our partitions. So we press N and enter um, to create our first partition. The number is going to be number one, which is the default. So just press enter. The first sector is going to be the first available sector we can use by default. So let's, let's just press enter. And now uh, they're asking us how big we want the partition to be. If we just pressed enter, it would use the whole disk. We don't want to do that. Um, we want to use just a bit of it for, uh, for our partition number one. So for an EFI partition, um, if, your disk, if your disk uses sectors of 512 bytes, which as you can see a few lines up, mine does indeed, um, 100 megabytes is sufficient. 100 megabytes is the minimum that you need to do an EFI partition. Um, if you, had, if you had an advanced functions or AF hard drive, which uses four kilobyte sectors rather than 512 byte sectors, um, you're gonna want your uh, EFI partition to be at least 260, 260 megabytes. Um, because we, you know, 100 megabytes would just be the bare minimum, um, and it's not exactly gonna be too much of a burden to have an extra 150 megs or so. I don't see any issue just making it 260 megabytes just in case um, we decide to, well, j j just in case really because um, those are you, we know that the partition has to be at least 100 or 260 megabytes. We might as well make it the larger one just to be on the safe side. So let's uh, press enter there. But again, I have made many GPT partitions 100 megabytes. I've never had a problem, but that's probably because all my drives used 512 byte sectors. So we're going to press P. It's going to show us that we've created um, the SDA1 260 megs, which is correct. We want to make our, but the only issue is that uh, it selected Linux file system as the type, which is not correct. So let's hit M again to see what the options are. And we need to um, Use the T command to change the partition type. Let's do L to list all the codes. Shift page up, page up, page up. Uh, number one is the EFI file system. So press one, press enter. So when we do P again, it shows that that's been changed. We need, now need to add a second partition. So let's do N. Uh, the default is correct. The default is correct again here. Uh, we want to make this, let's make this 512 megabytes, about half a gigabyte. They used to say take your RAM and double it, but that's not necessary anymore with the amount of RAM that we have in our modern machines. But you can feel free to make it a gig or two gigs, whatever you want. Um, the If you think that you're gonna be running out of RAM frequently and uh, there's gonna be swapping taking place, um, then you can feel free to add more um, swap space than what I'm doing. I'm kind of just doing the bare minimum just because uh, to have a, a safety net just in case. So and I don't want to waste too much disk space on things that I barely really even need anyway. So we already wasted 100, 260 megabytes on the EFI partition. So let's press enter, press P. Um, again, didn't, it didn't choose the right type. So press T uh, for number two. That's the default. That's correct. Let's, let's hit L to see the codes. Shift page up, page up, page up. Uh, we want swap, which is number 19. Press enter. P. You can see that it's changed that accordingly. So we want we want to add our third part and final partition now. So we'll do N. Uh, the default is correct. Uh, the first sector is correct. The last sector. Now is the time you can just press enter because it'll just use the rest of the disk. And that's uh, one of the reasons why I created the root partition last because uh, um, that way. Um, it just uses the rest of the disk by default, which is what we want. So do P, and you can see that everything is in order. We don't need to change the type of number three because third time is the charm. Finally, 
the default that it assumed is correct for SDA3. So we do W to write those changes and exit. There's no need to flag the partition bootable anymore. Okay, now that we partitioned our hard drive, we want to run the setup command. Um, we don't need any help, we don't need to change the key map, but if you accidentally pressed enter before um, and you really need to use a non-US uh, key map, you can, you can go down to that and change it now. We want to set up our swap partition, so we go down to that and press enter. It's auto detected it, so we press enter. No, we don't want to check for bad blocks, press enter. Okay, it's added that to FS tab, which uh, means that when we boot up the system after it's installed, um, the, the system will know uh, what to mount for the swap automatically. So that's that's pretty nice. So we select a uh, root partition now. It's automatically kind of found the one that we made before. So just press enter on that one, and uh, you can uh, just use the regular quick format and press enter. We're going to do this as ext4. Um, JFS is also a good, uh, or, or, or no, JFS I've never used. XFS is a good file system that I've used in the past. RiserFS is also good. I've used it in the past as well. But um, in terms of uh, a, a versatile, uh, all-purpose, robust file system, ext4 is is excellent. So I would just choose that one. Press Enter, and it will format that for you. Okay, and it's added the proper information to FS tab, so press enter. Um, it also auto-detected uh, our EFI partition that we made before in FDisk, um, and it's saying that we've made it, but it hasn't yet been formatted, which is true. Um, we knew that we'd be running the installer, so it found it, and we're going to press yes to format, which is going to format as FAT32, um, and, it and it's going to mount that automatically to slash boot slash EFI, which is fine. Some distributions mount that directly to boot, so just be aware of that, that it's gonna that Slackware mounts it to boot EFI, which also many distributions do as well. Um, Slackware is quite conservative in its methodology, and, and mounting uh, the EFI partition directly to boot is a newer thing, so it kind of makes sense that Slackware wouldn't follow that just yet. So press enter. Yes, we want to install from the Slackware uh, CD or DVD, so press enter. Let's scan for that automatically. It's going to say, hey, we found your device. And it's going to show us the packages that we can install, the package groups rather, that we can install. Now, basically, these are the ones that are going to um, form the basis of the system. Now, when, it, when we go to the next menu, um, it's going to say, how do you want to go ahead and install these? Do you want to install just all the groups that you've selected, or do you want to install um, manually, select and deselect certain packages? Um, I think that that's overkill for 99% of people. For us, just selecting the package groups that we want and um, selecting the full install from there will be perfectly adequate. I have no need for Emacs, so I'm going to press spacebar on there. Sorry if there's any fans out there of Emacs, I'm more of a VI guy, but you can feel free to leave that if you want. Press spacebar, and I'm going to press spacebar on KDE to deselect that. Um, since I won't really be um, demonstrating KDE, you can do that on your own time if you wish. And for the purpose of this virtual machine, I really am not going to need it. So scroll down. Um, I'm going to also deselect uh, the XFCE environment. I am going to leave the X window system and X applications selected, however. And now that I've done that, I'm going to press enter on OK, and I'm going to say full. And I'm going to press OK, and that's going to, that's going to install all the packages in the groups that I've selected. So that's a little bit unclear in the installer, but now you know. So I'm going to press enter. It's going to install all the packages from the groups that I've selected without prompting, and uh, it's going to take a little bit. So once that's done, um, you'll get out of the next step of the installer. So what I'm going to do is uh, pause the video and meet you back once this process has completed. All right, we're back. Now, the next question they're going to ask you once the packages have finished installing is whether you wish to uh, make a USB flash boot disk. Um, I'm going to say no, but feel free, feel free to do that if you're doing this on a physical machine and you think that you might make a mistake or 
not know how to recover from um, screwing up your uh, bootloader there. But I'm going to say no, skip. And basically, they're saying, look, we know you're using UEFI, so if um, you install Lilo, it's probably not, not going to work right. So they're, they're saying we should probably skip installing Lilo. So we're going to leave that and say yes, okay, skip Lilo. But they're going to say um, you should be installing eLilo. So that sounds pretty good to me. I'm going to say yes to that. Bear in mind there's other bootloaders out there. Uh, there's Grub um, 2.x, which uh, comes with Slackware 14.2 as a package as well, although it doesn't have, um, there's no way to install it automatically through the installer. So I'm not going to cover it. I also don't care for it at all. Um, I prefer eLilo. It's a lot easier to use in my view. Um, yes, it's been discontinued, um, but have I seen any security flaws reported? No, it's still widely used. Um, so until uh, it becomes an insecure p or, or non-functional piece of software, I don't see any issue. So I'm going to use eLilo, that, but just be aware that in a future release that may, may change. There's also a way using something called EFI stub to boot um, kernels directly from the UEFI firmware menu. Uh, I'm not going to cover that because it seems a little bit complicated, but just be aware that that's also an option if you're uh, going to be doing things um, a little more nitty gritty. You can feel free to do some research on that. Um, and also if you're a Macintosh user, if you're installing Slackware on a Mac machine, um, you know, you'll probably be okay installing eLilo, but just be aware that there's something um, that is going to be different uh, later on. And also, you may wish to use uh, something like uh, Refind, which is popular on the Mac side. Um, so, you know, follow my methodology if you want to, but just be aware there's other ways of doing things as well. So I'm going to say Install. Um, I am going to install a, a boot menu entry, but again, you know, take heed the warning there that uh, don't do this on an, an Apple machine, otherwise you can brick your firmware. So don't do that. Um, so I'm going to say uh, install though because I'm on VirtualBox. There's a bug though in VirtualBox that I'll let you know about later on, which means that once we shut down the virtual machine, any customizations that we've made to the UEFI firmware get wiped. So that wouldn't happen on a physical machine, but it happens on VirtualBox. So I'll show you how to work around that a little later on. So we're going to say yes, install, and it's it's added that boot entry there. Fine. Click OK. This default is correct for my mouse. Change it if uh, if your mouse is different. Again, this is only going to um, cover the console mouse most likely for the uh, GPM console mouse server. So just press OK. That should work fine. And here's where they're going to set up the GPM program at boot time. I'm going to say yes to that. Feel free to say no if you don't have any use for a mouse in your console. Yes, I do wish to configure the network. Press yes. Host name, I'm going to call it Darkstar. That's the old Slackware default, which is quite um, fitting because it's named after a Grateful Dead song. And as everybody knows, Patrick Volkerding is a, is a big deadhead. So we're going to put that as our default host name. You can put anything you want in there. Um, for our domain name, um, I'm going to call that local domain. Um, you can feel free to put your actual domain if you're doing this on a production server or if you're doing this in an existing network. I'm going to use DHCP. I'm not going to use Network Manager. That's not going to be covered in this series. Um, most ISPs do not require a DHCP host name, but some do. So if you do require that, you'll know about it and just enter that here. But I'm going to, just going to press enter because uh, I don't require one. And this information is correct, so I'm going to say yes. Now they want us to choose which services we want to start on boot up. Apple Talk, I have no use for that. Bind, I have no use for that either because I'm not going to be running a, a DNS server on my machine. Cups, I'm going to enable that because uh, that will allow us to print. Um, I'm not going to require DNS mask. Fuse is good to have. I'm going to enable the Apache web server because we're going to go through um, the, just the sheer basics of, of that a little, little later on. Um, 
I'm not an expert on Apache, but I do run it, so I'll show you how to do that a little bit in a later video. Um, IP forward, I'm not using the machine as a router, so I'm going to say no. DBus is very important to have running, so I'm going to say yes. I am going to enable MySQL, or I believe it's MariaDB now, but it's it's basically the same as MySQL. It's a fork. It works in the same way. Um, I'm going to keep NTP disabled, but if you wish to synchronize your uh, clock to um, network time, feel free to do so. That can be quite useful. PCMCIA, I have absolutely no use for, use for. That is primarily for older laptops. Um, RPC, I'm going to, because I'm not sure if I want to cover that or not in a later video, I'm going to leave it disabled for now, and if we do need it later on, we'll enable it at that time. Samba, I am going to enable because I'm going to show that off in a later video. Um, I don't require SASL. Send mail, I don't require that. Um, most ISPs block outgoing mail anyway. So, unless you're doing this on a production server with uh, a static IP and uh, so forth, leave that unchecked. Um, but again, if you know what you're doing, then you're going to know what you're doing and you're not going to listen to me. So, <laughs> I don't require that. I don't require, well, I, I do require a syslog, so we're going to leave that alone. Um, SSHD, leave that alone. I'm going to keep that enabled. And that's it. So we're at the bottom. So press enter. No, I don't want to try some custom screen fonts. Fonts, the default is fine. Um, the change this to yes under most systems. Um, if you're using a really old version of Windows and you want to dual boot, you'd say no, but that's really um, not going to be a very common setup anymore on most machines. Most machines do set their hardware clock to UTC these days, so I'm going to say yes to that and press enter. My time zone is Eastern. Now they're asking us for a default window manager. Um, I believe they're only going to set that up for root, so we're going to have to show you how to do that for your normal user later. But, you know, we might as well just choose one because they're asking us the question. And I'm going to choose Fluxbox. Um, in my previous series, I used Window Maker. You can choose whatever you want, but because when I do briefly show off some X applications, I'll be using Fluxbox. That's the one that I'm going to choose now. Okay, yes, we do want to set a root password, so press Enter. Type in your password, make sure it's a nice and secure one. Note that it's not echoed when you do so. Press enter, re-enter it. Again, it's not echoed. Okay, we've set our root password. So I'm gonna press enter. And now our base install is complete. Um, are we gonna have anything remotely resembling a uh, usable machine? No, we're not. But we've just completed the base install, so what I'm going to go ahead and do is press OK to reboot the system. Um, and I'm going to reboot, when I do reboot, I'm going to press the escape key multiple times during the VirtualBox boot up so that I can have the EFI menu pop up. So just be aware of that. I will meet you right back here. All right, we're back. One thing that I did, I did have to do um, in the uh, installer was to exit the installer and then to say, yes, I do want to reboot the system now. So that should be pretty self-explanatory. Just be aware that that was not uh, that was skipped in my pausing the video. So when I did <clears throat> reboot the system, I hit escape a bunch of times while the virtual machine was starting, and it took me to the uh, the EFI screen. So I'm going to go ahead and scroll down to the boot manager, which it will show um, Slackware as being the uh, number one um, boot option. Now, I don't really understand VirtualBox well enough to know if that's why it started Slackware instead of trying to start the DVD, maybe because it prioritized that. But either way, it didn't seem to matter that I didn't actually physically ask VirtualBox to take the disk out. But just be aware that that could be an issue for some people. But there's, there's Slackware as the, um, in the boot uh, menu. Um, but I'm not going to select that. If I did, just, you know... Uh, take my word for it that it would start Slackware. I'm going to do, I'm going to reboot um, my virtual machine here. And I'm not going to press anything this time, and you'll see that it will start Slackware all on its own. And um, there you go. So the default Lilo setup is not to prompt, so it just starts Slackware, which is fine. 
let's just wait for that to load up okay it actually is loaded up we had a couple of services that didn't start properly so um, it's kind of overlapping the login dialog box a little bit so I'm going to press enter a couple of times and uh, to clear that now I'm going to log in as root and type in my password and we're in um, it'll tell you if you have mail and it'll tell you um, a little blurb um, whenever you log in and that's run by the fortune command but you don't have to worry about that all you need to worry about is the fact that you're in and you're now running Slackware obviously there's a lot more to do to set up the system so the next video that I'm going to post is going to be um, post installation for Slackware 14.2 so that will be initial configuration tasks to get to just get a sane system running um, including uh, configuring the uh, kernel properly and adding a proper user um, and then from that point on we'll move on to specific configuration and usage tasks until then this is LA Rathbone signing off good night and good luck